landscape. <laughs> That's an awesome picture. Uh, if you ever have a chance to go to Antarctica, it's uh, like no other place. Uh, really interesting. So um, in the last year or so, I have uh, spent some time in actually in the space sector doing some research on space um, issues, uh, particularly open source software in space. Uh, you may not realize this, but Sony was actually involved with a project that landed on the moon in February. And we have some other space-related projects, so uh, that's something most people don't know about Sony. The very first thing I learned, uh, and actually I think everybody knows this, is that space is hard. Uh, and you can see that by the number of things that uh, don't quite work out as planned. Uh, even on the mission that we were on, uh, which uh, we were on a little rover that was on the SLIM mission uh, by JAXA, uh, we had problems. The SLIM lander didn't land in the optimal configuration. And um, the thing that really struck me, has struck me about the space industry is there are so many constraints. You know, we're used to having constraints in embedded, but man, uh, the space sector is, they, you've got temperature issues, you have radiation, uh, you have to be able to run in a vacuum, uh, vibration, that's just the hardware stuff. There are limits on power. If you're trying to go out on a 1U, uh, 1U CubeSat, you know, you're lucky if you can get a half watt uh, in, out of the solar arrays on this little 10 centimeter cube thing. Um, and then you have requirements for performance, fault tolerance, real time power management, and there's an extremely high cost per mission. A lot of times the missions have one unit. I'm used to consumer electronics at Sony where we're shipping hundreds of millions of units or something. You can amortize costs. You can't do that in space. Um, and so there's just, because of launch costs and operations costs, a mission is very, very expensive. And so you have this failure is not an option, and that actually creates a cycle where you, want, you do additional testing. You over-engineer for robustness. That's why some of the landers, the rovers that go up on Mars, you see they last you know, like 10 times their expected lifetime because they've been over-engineered. Um, and the thing also about space that's interesting is that it, everything is new up there. Um, they're still doing fundamental science about space. And a lot of the missions, so, and the focus is on the payload. Uh, I went to a conference, I tried to get people to talk to me about the operating system they were using. I, nobody could nobody could talk well they could but they, they were they're talking about the payload they're always talking about the payload um, and almost every payload is bespoke custom hardware um, and even the base systems are using novel hardware so the thruster, thrusters the batteries the stabilizers um, and the missions are trying something new everyone wants to try and uh, learn new things um, and so there are exceptions however so uh, we are starting to see cots hardware applied in space. So SpaceX famously is using uh, uh, x86 COTS processors on their rockets. Uh, and the, the way they're doing that is with triple redundant pairs of x86 processors uh, to handle the fault tolerance. Um, and there's Starlink, uh, Starlink, and there's a company called Planet Labs. They have satellite constellations, two of the largest constellations up there. Uh, and they're using x86 processors. They're not rad hardened. Uh, which is really interesting, uh, and they can do that um, using algorithmic redundancy. Um, uh, most famously, probably the Mars Ingenuity helicopter and the Perseverance rover and Backshell used some off-the-shelf uh, off parts. They had a Qualcomm processor, which was a mobile phone processor. Uh, they used COTS processors. They actually uh, used sensors that they got from SparkFun, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, so why am I even talking about this? Uh, well, uh, when I got into space, it, it kind of it was nostalgic for me. I, uh, way, way back early in my career, I used to do hand-coded assembly for embedded projects. And uh, it just reminded me of the issues that we all face, uh, the issues of constraints that we're dealing with, and the fact that we often have custom purpose devices and software. And it's often hard to find people to talk to about those things, um, uh, particularly for some parts of the stack. And so a lot of times, um, well, let me talk about uh, how that interferes with, that, that creates challenges for doing open source. So open source means collaboration. Uh, you, uh, please forgive me for doing a little bit of a remedial back step here. 
Uh, this is a uh, little resembles some of the training I do at, at uh, Sony for uh, some of our new engineers. So open source is defined by the ability to use, but also to contribute to the code base. So it's not the same thing as source available. Uh, and in my opinion, there are two really key effects, uh, the many minds effect and the problem solver effect. And those are, those are terms that I've come up to. So what is the many minds effect? Uh, we've all heard this before. It's the, the variety of experiences and skills results in better ideas. Uh, and so in open source, we're trying to achieve a meritocracy where the best ideas win. And I like to use a light bulb analogy. So ideas for a project are like light bulbs. Um, if you have a small community, then you'll have a small number of ideas. And just mathematically, it's really, really interesting. If you have a large community, you're going to have more ideas, more people contributing to it. And that just gives you mathematically a better probability that you're going to have some really good ideas in there. Okay, so in, in, when we expressed in terms of bug fixes uh, or bugs, uh, the many minds effects is, is often referred to, this is referred to as Linus's law, which was actually coined by Eric Raymond. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And I prefer to break that into two parts because I never kind of understood that line by itself. But basically, with the right eyeballs, you can fix any bug. But you have to have enough eyeballs, right? With enough eyeballs, uh, you have a better probability that you'll find the right eyeballs that'll see your bugs. And notice, this was key to finding the XZ backdoor that we just had. I don't know if you've read about the XZ backdoor, but it was a developer not involved in compression who found that, right? So uh, the fact that it was open source allowed people to uh, find that and fix that and, and mitigate it before it got out into the wild, uh, which was really, really important. Uh, the other key effect of open source uh, I call the problem solver effect. And so what that is, is this is a little picture of an amoeba. Uh, problems are solved as they are encountered. So the software has to kind of come in contact with the problem space in order to advance. So most software is written to solve a specific problem. In fact, I think it's 80% of all software is just in-house software that's written for a uh, single task. It never grows outside of its original niche. So, but open source is different. Open source software can grow outside of its original niche because people use it for things that the original author never intended. Um, and this results, and I see this in my own projects. I have this little project called Grab Serial on uh, GitHub, and it, I used it for timing the boot up time of the kernel, right? Because I used to do a lot of work on, on boot up time reduction. And, um, but it turns out, and I put it on GitHub, it turns out that all of the features that have come into that product in the last 10 years have been from people who are using it for other things. It turns out that uh, apparently people use it to monitor data streams on serial ports. Um, and I, so it's weird because as a maintainer, I didn't originate uh, probably, well, like maybe 10% of the features in the last 10 years are features that I originated. Um, and that's the problem solver effect. As people use software for an area outside its original uh, scope, uh, it grows and it, it becomes better. And then this results in the OSS virtuous cycle. The more problems a piece of software solves, the more users it attracts and the bigger the community gets. Well, how does that interact with this problem from the space industry? Um, and just really quickly, I want to talk about generalization versus specialization. So, uh, we all know the difference between Legos, and this is, these are the parts for a model spaceship, right? So if you're going to build a spaceship, arguably, it's much better to use the parts from the spaceship kit, right? The, you're going to end up with a better spaceship. You have these custom pieces that are exactly fit for what you need. Uh, now, you can make a spaceship with Legos. There's a picture of one there on the right. Uh, but... Uh, but the difference is that with the Lego pieces, you can also make other things, right? You can make a, a boat or a car or a house. Um, and even though the spaceship pieces are better for, for making the spaceship, the custom pieces, the Lego pieces are more general and they're more versatile. They can be used by, by more people. And the, you see the sa exact same effect on using modern hardware. So a modern processor, has all kinds of stuff on it that you probably won't end up using on your uh, project, right? And the reason for that is the uh, processor vendors 
are giving you a bunch of features that you can customize. Uh, and so the, a, a lot of the act of doing embedded work is specializing, uh, that uh, trying to use just the portions of the OS stack, uh, the user space stack, and the uh, features of the processor just uh, to optimize it, much as Artem was talking about. Um, and so you can think of the parts of the processor, the parts of the software stack that you're not using, kind of like the extra nubs or the rough edges on a Lego model. Um, the other thing that happens because of this customization, this specialization, is fragmentation, right? The most famous fragmentation was arguably the Unix fragmentation, uh, when Unix fragmented into a bunch of different camps because people wanted to, to specialize. They, the vendors wanted uh, their own secret sauce for their customers. But those different APIs meant that it was difficult to create an application ecosystem. And so the Unix fragmentation, I'll remind everyone, led us to auto tools. Uh, which, of course, led us to the XV backdoor, right? Uh, and so this fragmentation is not good. Uh, it adds complexity. Um, and a divided community, in particular, reduces all these open source effects that are good for, good for our industry and good for our ecosystem. Um, so given that you, we have these problems with embedded people always trying to specialize and open source people always trying to generalize, well, how does Linux make any inroads at all? Well, of course, we all know that. We wouldn't be here if we didn't, if we didn't recognize uh, some of these benefits, right? That uh, if you get into open source, the chance that there's something already there that you need that's already written uh, will be there. That's really high. Uh, if you look at what's available in Linux compared to uh, RTOSs in terms of uh, the tools, the drivers, the libraries, you can share the development cost even with your competitors. Uh, and, and there's a vast array of open source software available on Linux. Sometimes it isn't even, a, isn't even available on uh, uh, things like AI and ML. So we have the availability of this stuff. Um, and that extra, that extra software sometimes comes in pretty handy, even on a space mission where you'd think everything was predetermined. Um, but it turns out uh, several of the space missions that I researched I ended up using shell scripts and Linux distro features uh, to resolve issues when they hadn't intended to, right? Sometimes these issues come up. Ingenuity famously ended up try using compression to solve a log archiving problem um, and a, a data management problem. That was not in the original plan, but hey, gzip was on the distro, right? It was one of these extra things that they had not planned to use, but was there. And the same thing happened uh, in with Asteria and Alto CubeSats, I won't go into the detail of the stories there. But having those extra features, even if you don't plan to use them right now, uh, is really beneficial and can be for your product. Even if your product is uh, you know, hundreds of millions of miles away and you need to do something you didn't anticipate. Um, so given these challenges, what are some of my recommendations to over overcome this dichotomy between generalization and specialization? Um, and I have it down to just these four things. So very first thing, you want to increase the community, right? The bigger the community, the more open source effect you get. So the very first thing, step number one, join a community. If you're not on the mailing list, if you're not in the project as a visible member of the project, uh, then the community is less one person than it should have. Um, and then you should enhance the community, right? You can invite others. Do something to make the community more valuable. A lot of us are hesitant to join communities uh, because we don't think we have something to offer, right? We th a lot of people get it totally backwards. They think that the first thing you got to do is commit code. There are so many other ways to add to a community. And actually, I think the very first thing to do when you join a community is talk about your usage of Linux. The maintainer can't take into account your requirements if he doesn't know them. And so when you get on a mailing list, just say, hey, guess what? I'm, you know, if, especially if you're doing something different, tell other people about what you're doing, how you're using the software that's different from how they're using the software. That is so valuable. I'm a maintainer for a couple of projects myself, and I love to see new users and new usage reports. Uh, and there's all these other things you can do. The other thing is make sure that you improve the generalization. This means that you have to take, when you're making contributions, you have to take into account 
what other people, uh, other people's use cases, what they want to do with the software. It's so common in open source to, for developers to fix their issue, and that's good. That introduces, you know, that helps the user, the, the code base grow into a new niche, but you have to take into account other people's use cases. The more you do that, the more that uh, the open source effects kick in. The other thing, don't specialize where you don't need to. We're seeing this actually in the space sector. I already talked about it a little bit. Uh, use the same hardware that others are using, right? Don't go off on a, uh, creating weird stuff if you don't need to. Use the same subsystems. Uh, and don't over-reduce. Uh, there's a temptation in embedded. We're, we now have the luxury, our processors are advanced enough, the, we have a lot of memory uh, on, on modern embedded systems. Zephyr can tackle the low-end stuff. It, with a Linux system, you're usually talking 32 at least megabit, uh, megabytes of memory. You don't have to trim down every last little thing. Uh, so leave some stuff in there just in case you want to use it later. Um, and then the last thing, and I, this may be the most important, is find allies, allies uh, that care about your issues and work with them, right? So if you care about small system size, of course, if you're doing IoT devices, you care about that. Well, it turns out that the security researchers also care about system size because they want to reduce the attack surface. So they have something in common they can work on together, they can collaborate on. With Quick Boot, right, we heard about our automotive Linux uh, and consumer electronics, right? But it turns out desktop users also want fast boot. And cloud servers also want fast boot. So there are other people in the community. Don't make the mistake of thinking you're the only person in the community that wants a particular feature. Uh, and then low power usage, right? We all know that uh, mobile phone and IoT wants low power usage for longevity of device. Uh, but turns out the data center people, right, who are using a significant portion of worldwide power, they also care about power. So find your allies in the open source world and work with them. And if you do that, if you overcome some of these challenges, uh, one, it's possible to do it. You can make the world a better place, not just for yourself, but for others. And the great thing about open source is while you're making the world a better place for everyone, you're also making your own development life easier uh, by working upstream. And so with that, I will say thank you for your time. Okay.